This is Danny O'Halloran. He's a retired career criminal who has spent half his adult life in prison. He was born in 1936. He's worked with, or met, or fought with most of the major London villains of his time. The well-known and the unknown. He's 69 years of age and in poor health. And the year is 2005. Mr. O'Halloran, would you tell me, because you knew them... Hold on a minute. Before you go any further... Don't call me Mr. O'Halloran, for God's sake. You make me feel like I'm bleeding trial here. You ain't a judge and we ain't in court. You just call me Danny, please. That makes me feel better, thanks. Um, so, Danny, you knew the craze, the twins, Ronnie and Reggie. What did you think of them? Well, I didn't like them. I liked their older brother, Charlie, though. Charlie was all right. Stopped a lot of people getting hurt, did Charlie? But the twins were bullies and thieves ponces. Now, for people who don't know what a thieves ponce is, I'll tell you. It's someone who don't go and get their own work. Now, they'd take from other career criminals who'd suffer it, I believe well wouldn't. And worst of all, they'd take from the working class, straight goers. Now, straight goers are what you are. People who go to work. Well, most of you are, anyway. <laughs> but what they'd do is they'd go into a pub or they'd go into a snog shop, anywhere that made money, and they'd walk in and they'd demand money with menaces. Now, if these people didn't pay, there were people that stood up to them. And if they didn't pay, they'd get their arms broken, they'd get their legs broken, and then they'd end up in hospital. And Reggie and Ron would go up to the hospital afterwards and they'd apologise. Now, they was very good at apologising, believe it or not, now, these people we've been laying in the hospital when they go, look, we're sorry about that, but, you know, you did provoke us, so let's just call it like we're partners and we'll move on. Now, these people come out of hospital and they go, oh, Reg and Ron are all right, you know, they come and said sorry. Now, and then all of a sudden, they'd own the business outright within six months. Now, I had a slight fallout with Ronnie when I was in my 20s. And I was going up to their club, the Double R Club. It was one of their first ones. And so I've gone in, and I'm waiting there for my mate, Tony Taroni. I'll tell you about him later. He's from South London. So I've got their club first. And you know, you walk in, you go, all right, all right, you spot a couple of people, but I'm on my own. So I go up to the bar, and I'm standing there, and I get myself a drink. And out of the distance, I spot Ronnie with all these little kiss-ass mates. And Charlie making a beeline for me. Now, I know he's coming towards me because it was like the parting of the Red Sea. As soon as he comes walking over. Now, I don't know how they didn't put this in any books or films because no one knows this. He used to bite his nails all the time. Made him look like more of a paranoid schizophrenic. So he's walking over at me like that. I ain't got a clue what it's about. And he comes up and he goes, you got some fucking front showing your face in here, ain't ya? I don't know what you did last week. Now, do yourself a favour and fuck off before I hurt you in front of everyone here. While he's talking to me like that, I'm looking at him, but I clock Charlie over his shoulder and he's doing that, you know, I am saying nothing. So, I put my drink down and I walked out. And as I'm walking out, he shouts, don't go too far, I might want to speak to you later. Now, everyone in that club saw how he spoke to me. So I've gone home. And I've had a good thing, a good thing about what's happened. And back in them days, I didn't always have one. I had a yogger indoors at the time. A, a yogger's Roman gypsy for what we call a gun. So I'm debating what to do next. And I've only got one choice now. Not that I like it, but it's the only choice I've got. I've got to go back to the club. So... I've loaded up my gun and I've heard, ordered a cab to go back there. Now, I said I didn't like Reggie and Ronnie. I didn't say they, were, they weren't dangerous. They were dangerous. So I know this is a one-way trip. I ain't coming back. 
but I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. So, I walk back into the club. Everyone see me. All standing in their little groups, you know, he's back, he's back. So, I walked up to the bar, got myself a drink again, and I'm there looking for Ronnie. Now, out of the crowd, comes Charlie. All excited, he's seen me like that, he's come running over, and he's come up to me, he's going, oh, Dan, Dan, I'm so glad you came back, mate. Listen, my brother thought you were Jackie Taylor, and I told him who you was, and he wants to apologise. Let me go and get him. So he walks up. Now, I'll, have, I'll have to be honest, I was, uh, I was a little bit conflicted what to do. So I'm waiting now, and up comes Ronnie with Tony Lambriano and a few others, and Charlie again. And he comes up to me and he goes, listen, um, one of my boys told me he was Jackie Taylor and I got it wrong. It's Danny, isn't it? Danny O'Halloran. And I went, yeah, that's right. I mean, look, no hard feelings. Now, I didn't take his hand. Now, his mates are looking at me, then they're looking at him. Charlie's going, oh, God, like that. And he leans in, squints through these little bloodshot eyes of his with them glasses, and he goes, have we got a fucking problem here? I went, look, I accept your apology, Ron, but we might have a problem because you've got one with Jackie Taylor and Jackie Taylor's a good mate of mine. <laughs> so, he goes into his top pocket. He ain't took his eyes off me. He goes in his top pocket and he pulls out his giant cigar and he sparks it up and takes a big puff of it and blows it just over my shoulder, not in my face, but in my general direction. And he leans in again and he goes, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, eh? <laughs> For now, have a drink on the house. And he walked away. Now, whenever I bumped into the twins and Charlie after that, they'd have a drink with me. Or they'd send one over if I was in company. But it didn't mean that I liked them. And I weren't the only one. Now, they had people who worked for them and people who took work from them. Now, there's a difference. There's a big difference in that. The people who took work from them, I'd have been more worried about. Now, these two weren't the, the most powerful villains in the world. They was just the most well-known. There was loads out there just as bad, just as dangerous, if not worse. Now, one of them that used to take work off of Reggie and Ronnie, you probably haven't heard of. Maybe there's a few people here that have. But one man was called Alfie Gerard. Now, Alfie was one bad, bad man. If they were sending Alfie to see you, you want to move country. Now, his partner was Freddie Foreman. Them two were best mates. Who do you worry about? The man that's sending them or the man that's going to do the killing, and that's what them two would do. Now, if I had a problem with Alfie Gerard, I'd have been outside my house with a Gatling gun and sandbags everywhere. Now, it weren't just the South Londoners that didn't like them. There was people that worked from that didn't. And I quite like a lot of South Londoners. Two of my pals, proper stuff from South London. And one of them, who I just told you about, Tony Taroni, proper, proper man. <laughs> and Frankie Fraser. Now, I like Frank. I always liked Frank because he was a gentleman. He weren't a bully. He was only that big. He was tiny. But one dangerous, dangerous man. You'd come bang unstuck with Fraser, you would. Oh, not many. Now, I can give you an example. Something Frank did. I was banged up with him in Parkhurst. I was finishing off a sentence in there. And <laughs> this is how people come unstuck with Frank. Now, I used to socialise with Frank a lot. And when I first got to Parkhurst, I found out he's running our wing. I thought, lovely, because I'd met him through Taroni. Now, he was um, the daddy of the wing. I'd, now, most people here might know what a daddy is, but for the people who don't, he's basically the most powerful or respected man on the wing. It's not really like that nowadays, but it was like that then. And Frank weren't a bully. You get bullies. But Frank weren't like that. And I've got on the wing and he, Dan, what are you doing here, mate? Oh, he give me a load of tobacco and all the nice things that take weeks to get, he give to me straight away. Good man. So I spent a lot of time with him. And I'd sit there and I'd play cards with him and we'd have a chat. And then this one week, we found out that there's this big jock, this big Scottish fella. He's been transferred to our wing. Now, what happened? I don't know if this is true. I'm not too sure if, you know, but anyway, apparently someone's been in his self-even and he's bashed the life out of this fella on our wing. 
Now, if, that's, if, he, if he did do that, then I'll make him absolutely right for doing that. But he ain't content with finishing now. Now he fancies his chances with Frank. It's a bad move. Bad, bad move. So, one of these afternoons, I'm sitting there with Frank, playing cards, and there's a few other cons around us, and then he comes. It's a big jock now. We all knew something was going to happen. You can tell, most people can tell when something's going to happen. So I'm looking, he comes through the door. Frank ain't even acknowledged him. And he goes, Fraser! Fraser! I hear you're the main man here. Now Frank ain't even looked up at him. He's holding his cards and he went, my name's Frank. Are you a screw? And this fella don't know what to say, does he? He's just stood there, he went, what do you mean am I a screw? He said, well, only the screws call me Fraser. Now, this fella's come walking over. As he's come walking over, everyone knows this is going to go off here. But I fancy Frank, because this fella don't really know him by the sounds of it. And he comes over to him and he goes right up to his face, puts his hands on the table where we're sitting playing cards, and he's that far away from him. And he says, I can't see how the other men man here, Fraser. I was a daddy and lawmost, Frank. Went, well, you're only going to be someone's mummy in here, mate. You'll go down like that. And he's going on playing cards. Now this fella's fuming. He's got veins popping out of his neck. He's gone bright red now. All the, all the, like, all the cons are standing laughing through their hands. Now they don't want to do it blatantly because they are a bit worried about him. But I'm laughing blatantly. Frank's just deadpan. Now he's lent right in this fella like that. He's lent on the table. He's even closer to Frank's face. And he didn't even finish his sentence now. He went, why don't me and you? And Frank just grabbed him by the back of his head, bit his nose, bit a chunk out, straight away. The fella's screamed out, the fight's over. I don't care how big or strong you are, everybody bleeds the same. And this fella, for all his big strength, was screaming, hold his nose. Now Frank's got hold of him, chucked him on the floor. Well, he didn't need to chuck him. Not in that state. And then he's got on top of him and he started working that schnoz. Now, I ain't got involved. I've just sat back and let him do it. <coughs> now, the reason you do that and don't get involved is because if you try and stop Frank from doing that, he's going to want to do me. I'll do the same. If I'm having a round and someone wants to try and pull me off, I'm going to do them. You don't stop one, someone when they're on the job because they might want to get up and do you. So you have to finish it. But I've heard the screws, haven't I? You can hear the chains going there, running down the corridors. I'm going, Frank, Frank, now I can get him up. Frank, screws. I've got him by his shoulders. I've pulled him up. And he's just gone and sat back down in his chair. We all clare it around his boat like Dracula and just picked up his cards like that. And the screws are coming. They've got us all up, their arms up, our backs. They've took him up to the infirmary. Now, I'll give the fella his due. He didn't say a word. He kept his mouth shut. He didn't grasp. What he did say, when they asked him what happened, he said, I fell, Gav. Same as us. We all said the same. Or slipped. One of the two. But that goes to show. Never judge a book by its cover. This, this fellow was like that, and he thought he could do Frank, and Frank showed him. Now, that's a very good example. Now, this fella, he must have had, I don't know, 10 or 20 stitches. And Frank's walked away with nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Do you normally spat in when people are talking? Well, I, I, I thought it was time to ask this question if you don't mind. And it is, <coughs> your career as a question, <coughs> um, where did it start? How did it start? Well, the heavier stuff started when I got out of Ballstall. But it obviously started somewhere else, didn't it? Because I wouldn't have been in there in the first place, would I? But before that, it was petty stuff. Childish stuff. And I suppose, you know, I'm not going to blame him because I made my own choices, but I suppose I was a little bit influenced by my older brother, Eddie. Now, he was a thief before me. Now, I couldn't go out with Eddie. He would never have took me with him, and he was a bit older, and also I had my own little partners in crime. And one person I bonded with in particular was a fella called Tommy Anniver. Now, Tommy, Tommy was born Roman Gypsy, and I was half Irish. Now, back then, nobody liked the Irish. There were signs in windows. 
No, no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. So we used to get it, and Tommy was a Romany. Even to this day, people say things about gypsies, didn't they? So me and Tommy had to be a bit nasty. And we had to have a row, because of the bullies. And Tommy, unlike me, could have a right row. He would roll about on the floor with anyone. And he had hands like that. Oh, well, I was like that. So I had to, you know, I had to be a little bit different. I had to be spiteful. I had to be nasty. I didn't have much else going for me. And I'll give you a, a little example of what these bullies were like. One of my earliest memories being young, and I'll tell you why I remember this age. I remember being 10 years old, and I'm coming back to me stand with some sweets on me. And I've turned this corner, and this, this is 1946, year after the war. And I remember there was this house on this corner, and it had been bombed, stray bomb, with bricks and that everywhere. I got up, I moved out of the way like that, and I've turned the road, and these three kids are coming towards me, older kids. One of them, a right big lump in the middle. Now, I don't care if you're a kid, or an adult, or a villain, or a straight goer, we all know when we're in trouble. We all know when something's going to happen and someone's going to hurt you. you. You can just tell. It's that fight or flight feeling. Now, as soon as they got within talking distance, it started, didn't it? Guess one of them sweets, mate. What you got? And then just snatched the bag right off me. Now, I'm not content with that. The little arsehole wants to show off in front of his mates now. Now, I've got three of them. Like that, my back's up against the wall, and they're all standing in front of me now. Now he wants to start digging me out, taking the piss out of me clothes and all that, and he started pushing me. Now, I've only got two choices, haven't I? One of them is I can let them kick the shit out of me. I don't like that idea. The second one is I can fight back, but out of bleeding the hell am I going to fight this boy? He's twice my size and he's got two mates with him. I'm never, ever going to beat him in a fair fight. So, this is where Spiteful comes in. So while he's pushing me and he turns to his mates, they all do that, don't they, when they're showing off, turn to their mates like, how funny am I? I've toe-punted him right up the bollocks. He's dropped to his knees like he's receiving a knighthood. I've turned round to this brick wall. There's a loose one on the top there. I've picked it up. I've twatted him right over the nut with it. He's bowled over, not knowing what body part to hold first. His mates are standing there like that, with their jaws hitting the floor. So I've got a brick in my hand, and I've turned to them and gone, do you fucking want some and all? You know what they've done? Bolted. Run and left him. So, took the sweets off of the floor what he had in his pockets, and I went on. Up there for thinking, down there for dancing, see? But why I remember this is not long after that, now I'm 10, I fell severely ill. Now it turns out I had TB. Now the younger generation here might not think that's bad, TB, but it used to kill you stone dead back then. So I'm, I'm in it, I'm banging trouble. Now, I'm in hospital, and the doctors tell me, Mum and Dad, I'm not going to live till I'm 30. Now, when I was in my 20s, I didn't think that I'd live till I was 30, and it had nothing to do with the illness. But anyway, it's quite hard for your parents to take. And I loved it in there. I've got no school. I've got a couple of teachers coming up, but they all feel sorry for me, didn't they? So I'll get away with murder. And I didn't learn a thing. And I was in there for four years, from the age of 10 to 14. I was in there. Now, I didn't learn a thing, and I've come out pretty ignorant, if I'm being honest. And I've gone back to what I knew before that. So, I'm out with Tommy again, and we're up to no good. And I'm not proud of this, but now I'm the age of about 16. Yeah, I'm 16 now. And me and Tommy done our local off licence. Now, that was a wrong and thing to do. He was a working class man and we've wiped him out. Now, I had no one teaching me right from wrong then. No one was telling me the rules of the game then. I had to learn myself the hard way. So, I got caught. Tommy didn't. And I ended up in Ballstall. Now, Ballstall back in the 50s was a completely different animal to anything that you see today. The age group was 16 to 21. 
If you think about that, a 16-year-old boy and a 21-year-old man banged up together, it should never have been allowed. Now, you can imagine the kind of bullying that went on with that age group. Now, the thing is, you'd think it was just the cons you'd need to worry about. No, it weren't. Now, the establishment will deny, deny, deny this, but we had nonces in Ballstorm. Now, if you think for one minute, an institution with young boys ain't going to get infiltrated by these kind of people, you're being bleeding naive. Now, I'm not saying I saw it. Even at that age, I wouldn't stand for it. And neither would the other cons. But what you do see is a relationship between a screw and a prisoner and it's unhealthy. They'll get all sorts of benefits. They're going in their cell. And even though they're getting these benefits, you can tell that these people ain't happy. And at the night time, you can hear certain, um, certain cries and whimpers. Now, I wish to God I could wipe these noises out of my head, but I can't. Now, I'll give you another example of something I did actually see that was outright disgusting from a screw. We had this young kid transferred in. 16 years old, my age, but an absolute mummy's boy. You know, one of these kids turns up and you look at him and go, what the fuck are you doing in here? You know, he was looked molly coddled, he didn't have a clue. He was utterly clueless, this kid. Now, the first night he's banged up, we're all in ourselves and I can hear him. The whole wink in here, he's crying at the top of his voice. Now, I ain't got anything against anyone who has a cry in prison, as long as you keep it to yourself. You've got to do that. You've got to keep it to yourself. Now, I, if these 16-year-old kids are getting banged up, I'll guarantee they'll have a cry. But you don't do it at the top of your voice. Now, the whole wing can hear him. He's sobbing, this kid, and you can hear him going, Ah, oh, do you want your mummy? Do you want to come and lie down with me, diddums? Now, I'm sitting there thinking, this poor little sod, who's really going to get it tomorrow? He's up shit creek without a paddle now. So, next morning's come now. In Ballstall, they used to open the doors at six in the morning and make you go for a two-mile run. That's the start of the day. The rest of the day is work and education. Now, the work in Ballstall ain't what you think it is. It was proper hard graft. You're doing forestry, bricklaying, all sorts of mad stuff. And I, you know, I've never been built for that anyway. But we all had to do it. So we've come out at six in the morning. He's come out of his cell, the little fat kid. He's going, what do we do? What am I doing? I went, shut up. Shut up and just, just do what we do. Now, we're going to go on this run. And one of these screws here was a fella called Mr. James. One horrible bastard. He had one of them faces like he could permanently smell shit. We all know someone like that. So, him and this other screw have taken us on the run. Little fat kid's with us. Now, we've got 500 yards into the run, and the little fat kid's gone, <coughs> boom, bolt right over. Now, this Mr. James has seen, he's running, gone, stop! Stop! And he's turned around, the fella's on the floor, and he's gone, get up! Get up, you fat little shit, for I'll take you back to your cell and give you something to worry about. Now, we can see he's in trouble. The kid's on the floor, going, like that, I know all about breathing, trust me. But what he did next shocked a lot of us. He stood back like that, and he's toe-punted him right in the chest like he was taking a fucking penalty, the dirty bastard. I'd apologise for the language. Now, we've screamed blue murder. You can imagine. What are you doing? Shout out, I'll bang you all up. You won't get no breakfast. Now, we're going to riot. The other screw with him knows we're going to do our nut, but he knows the fella's in trouble. So he's gone running over to the kid, got his arm like that, stuck it around him, and took him back to the infirmary. Now... <laughs> Excuse me. He's took him back to the infirmary. Now it turns out this little fat kid had asthma. It was too late. He was brown bread. Accidental death, they said. Now, in prison, it's nigh on impossible to go unnoticed. I tried. The first thing I did when I got there was try to educate myself. I'd lost out on so much, so I took the opportunity and I read everything I could. I read English, geography, astronomy. I even read some of the classics. I remember reading Oliver Twist in there. Now, 
One thing I found through reading, which is different to TV, and this is a good example, is I loved Ron Moody as Fagan, but in the book, I didn't. He's a thief with a load of kids wrapped around him, you know? Don't look good, does it? But I tried to keep me nut down, and like I told you, every single wing will have a daddy. And we had one. And he was one horrible, horrible bastard. His name was Jojo. Now, this Jojo was 21, finishing his sentence, like that, built like a toilet door, huge. Muscles out there, he's in the gym every opportunity, this arsehole. Now, with a bully, they take turns. They'll start on one person, they'll start on you, then they'll start on you. They don't do it everyone at the same time, they, they pick and choose, and now it's my turn. And now that starts is I'm in my cell, reading, it come in, and just start taking things. And then it progressed, sitting down eating. And he'd come and sit opposite me, look me right in my eyes and just start taking things off my plate. Now, I swallowed. I let this go on. I'm not going to say, oh, I fought a good fight. I didn't. And then, uh, and then I got some bad news when I was in there. I told you my older brother Eddie was a thief. And he was on his way to a bit of work on the motorway and um, he's hit this lorry truck up the arse and it had a load of scaffolding poles on the back of it and I ended up going through the windscreen and he died on sight. And they didn't even let me go to the funeral. Now, this Jojo, not long after that, he makes the fatal mistake of saying something about my brother. Now I'm going to do him. Now I'm going to fucking hurt him bad. But I can't do it in a straight up. I'm not going to do it in a fair fight. I'll even, no matter how angry I am, I have to do it another way. I need a talk. And there's only two places you can do someone in, in the nick. It's either when they're asleep in their cell or in the showers. I prefer the showers because everyone's stark bollock naked and you know they ain't got a tool on them. So the next step was, I got this razor blade, just a run of the mill razor blade. And I got a toothbrush. Sharpened the end of the toothbrush like that. Broke off the bristles and you get a bit of chewing gum. And you put them where the bristles are. And I place razor blade in place and got a bit of string tied it up as tight as I can. Now the problem is I've got to get it in the showers, haven't I? So I wangled myself a job cleaning their carsies. Oh, Jesus, they're bleeding carsies. And the showers. So I'm in there with me mop, like that. And I'm thinking, where the bleeding am I going to put this toilet? I've come across the blood hole. It's loose. I've gone down like that. And I've picked up the blood hole, like that. I pulled out my tool, got a bit of string like that, tied it on and dropped it down. Now I know I've got to be the first one in the showers the next day. So standing by the wall like that, busting a gut to get in, the screws are giving me the nod and I'm in like a whippet and I'm straight for the plug hole. And I pull out the tool like that and a few cons come in behind me and they spot me. But they don't do a thing, they know it ain't for them. So I soak myself up. Now the reason you do that is you get these big strong bullies who want to get older, it's a bit hard to get hold of a jelly deal, wouldn't it? You like that? <laughs> so I've got this tool, and in he comes, Jojo. Everyone's watching out the corner of their eye, right? like that. Muscles bulging, cock swinging the mug. And he goes under the shower. And I creep up to him like that. They're all looking. And I grab him by his shoulder and I went, crash, I've done him twice. Bad. Right down the boat. Now luckily. Luckily, he didn't scream out like that. You do that with open wounds, you're in trouble. So he's screaming through gritted teeth now, like that, screaming his head off. I've dropped the tool, the screws are coming like that. They've got all our arms up our backs. They've took him up to the infirmary and took us back to ourselves, stark bollock naked. Now, just like the jock who came in with me and Fraser, I'll give him his due. I didn't like Jojo, but he kept his mouth shut. And they said, what happened? He said, I'll slip, Gov. They know the screws know, don't they? And everyone else said the same. Now, I'm the daddy of our wing. 
made my time go a bit easier, I'll tell you that. So, when I got out of Ballstall, I didn't want to go back. Now, all these so-called villains who go, I'll do that prison time standing on my head are mugs. None of us want to go to prison. We take massive lengths to bleed and avoid it. It's only show-offs that go, yeah, three years, I'll do that. Bleeding idiots. But you have to weigh things up a bit. It's like gambling with your liberty. So, I was petty stuff before that, and I'm thinking, right, you know, petty jobs, small pay, small prison time, big jobs, big pay, but big chunks of bird. Now, I chose the latter. Now, I'm out of prison, and I've stepped, I've stepped up to cutting open lorries. When I mean cutting open lorries, you get these big 40-footers with a canvas on them, you cut them up, you load up your vans, and you're off. Now, if I could have took the old bleeding lorry, I would have done, and I was doing warehouses. Now, these, these things are all insured. I'm not hurting no one. And then, this is when I met Tony Taroni for the first time. I'm over in South London now, and I'm 18 years old, I'm in this pub, and this big ginger fella has ended up having a row with three people at the same time. Now, he's holding his own to start with. Give him his due, he was up, but you can't win with three. Normally, I don't get involved. And I don't know what come over me, but I steamed in. I'm only 18, this fella's like 27, 28. He's a grown man. And I've steamed, and we've done them. We've done them bad. We've bashed your granny out of them. Now, Taroni don't know me a bar of soap, I'm just a kid. And after he's hearing, fuck me, boy, you are fucking powerful. See you, I'm having you on the firm. And from that day on, we was best mates. He treated me like a younger brother. Loved him, proper man. And then, when I got to 21, Taroni approaches me with my first bit of pavement work. They're going on the pavements, what we call going on a bank robbery. And I was so excited. I felt like Butch Cassidy in a Sundance kid until he told me I was a bleeding driver. Now, the reason the driver is the hardest, no one would think this, the driver is the hardest job out of the lot, believe it or not. And I'll tell you why, how this will happen, is that on this job, me and Tony will pull up outside the bank, he'll put a stocking on his head, no, he did look funny with a bleeding stocking on his head, <laughs> his nose squashed down in it. So he puts a stocking on his head, and he goes in and he calls his murders. He'll go straight in there, maybe let one rip, go, everybody stay where they are. Now, what you've got to do is get everyone together. Herd them together in one spot. So you can keep your eye on them better. And you don't want no one running out of the bleeding bank either, do you? Now, this is over in minutes. Literally minutes. He'll be in there, get everyone together, get the bank manager, get as much money out of him as possible, make him fear for his life and all. You have to be a bit nasty to get money out of these people. And he'll come running out to the car where I am. Now, his job's over, isn't it? His job's done. His responsibility is finished. But the driver's still on the clock. I have been from day one. Now, the pressure's on. Now, the whole time he's in there, I haven't got his adrenaline. I'm sitting outside the bank. There's people pushing their pram by not knowing what the bleeding hell's happening in there. And I've got to look the same. I can't sit there looking nervous. Now, if someone ran out of that bank, I have to stay put. I have to do it. If I hear bleeding sirens, I don't move. I don't move until that man's dead. Simple as that. So now I've got to get him, myself, and the prize back to our slaughter. Now, oh, slaughter's um, something that we, the word that we use for storing things. Now, you don't pull off a hundred mile an hour. You do get away quickly. You don't hang around the scene of the crime, but you don't pull off, you know, a thousand mile an hour unless you've got the old bill up behind you. That's why you have a gun and all, because you might have to start shooting at the radiator, the tyres, anything to stop them. But this didn't go like that. But there's things that can happen without the old bill involved. You can go down a one-way street, bang, all of a sudden you've got a dust cart in front of you, and a car blocks you in, like what the bleeding hell to do now. But this went all right. This did go up. Now, Tony was one of these people who showed me who I should have been taken from. And it was the banks. Everyone in that bank still got their money at the end of the week. Didn't matter how much I took, I ain't hurting the little man. And I like that feeling. Taking from the, the so-called elite of this world was fine with me. And that does include individuals. Now, I personally, I don't like robbing people, but there are 
certain situations where it's allowed, and it's called a wrap-up. When you wrap someone up, you know, it's obvious, isn't it? And I can give you a, one job that I did, where this involved a wrap-up. And I had a friend of mine approach me, and he said, look, Dan, I've got someone who's got a bit of work for you. Do you fancy, you know, coming and finding out what it's all about? And I went, yeah, of course I do. I'm always up for a bit of work. So we went to a pub called The Two Puddings in Stratford. And I'm there, my pal's here. And this fella sitting in front of me is a chauffeur. And he's there on behalf of his boss. Now, he must have been bleeding close to his boss because what he said to me next shocked me. I'm out the shock. But what he said is he said, listen, my boss has got a problem with someone and I've been told you're reliable and we want him to disappear. Okay. So, he's giving the fella's details, a picture of him. Now, we don't do women and children. I always make sure someone's not there. Now, when their wife and kids are there, I'm not doing it. And he's told me all of his movements, where he works, where he drinks, where his golf club is, his gentleman's club up in St. James's Street. I knew everything there was about him. So I said yes, and I took the job. But I had no intention in killing him. I just thought I'd rob him blind instead. And I was, I'd was i have robbed the other fellow who was giving me the work if I knew where he lived. These people were all targets to me, the bleeding blue bloods. I left a lot of them. So for a job like this, I didn't need Tommy Enever. Tommy's too aggressive for this. The geezer will end up pissing himself. We don't want that. Taroni, too loud. Couldn't have him on that job. Everyone in, bleeding, in London would hear him. So I went to my other best mate. This is another close, proper, proper man. And we all called him Nicely Nicely. I'm not going to tell you about his name. This is just his nickname. Now, he was one of these people who was so polite and utter gentleman, but you don't want this man as an enemy. You don't want to be looking over his shoulder. The reason we called him nicely is that's what everything was. Now, now, come on, boys, we're going to do this bit of work. Now, 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 let's do this nicely, nicely, nicely. And he used to do it in the banks. He'd jump up on the counter. We'd go, everybody put your hands in the air. Let's do this nicely, nicely, nicely. <laughs> anyway, I've gone to nicely. I've gone, look, I've got this bit of work. Are you up for it? And he's like, well, well, yeah, of course I am, boy. I am right. Let's go and do it. Now, he's got all the two police uniforms. So, both dressed up like cosers. And we've got, and we'll just call him George. We've gone on his door, this George. It's in Kensington. We've knocked on the door and he's opened it up and he's absolutely shat himself because he's probably never had two old Bill on his door before. And it's like that. And he said, oh, what's going on? I said, now, listen, can we come in and talk to you? We've got some really bad news for you, I'm afraid. I said, okay. Now, Door, door goes open, he steps back, now we're in. Shut the door. And he says, well, officers, what's the bad news? And I said, well, the bad news is you're going to have to tell us where your safe is, mate. And now he looks at nicely, looks at me. Now he kept his call a bit, nicely shows him what he's got down his belt. And then nicely wraps him up, ties him up. Now this fella stayed cool the whole time, stiff upper lip and all that. He was a bit old school, this fella. I thought he'd be a lot you know, more frightened than what he was. So he's told me where his safe was. I've gone upstairs. Now, this was one clever little sod. Now, any burglar would have gone round there, never have found it. His safe was in a wardrobe, and you push the wall back like that and pull it across, and there's his safe. Now, while I'm loading up in there, he's got... Now, a lot of people back then had cash. It's not like now, everything's bleeding digital. He's got cash there and all. So I'm loading up there, and he's got a load of Tom in there as well. Look, um, Tom's what we use... For Joel, it's just another name, Tom Forward. So I'm taking all this out, and I'm having a load up, and then I can hear it downstairs. I can hear him talking. I can hear nice again. Now, now that's it, George. That's that. That's it, mate. You stay calm. You don't need to get excited because if we was going to hurt you, we'd have already done it, wouldn't we, boy? Do you want a cup of tea? Four. Did he just offer him a bleeding cup of rosy? I thought I knew we didn't have to be nasty here, but that's taking the piss, isn't it? So. I've gone downstairs, but I've got the bags like that, and he's gone. I'm looking around them nicely. They're in the bleeding kitchen. He's tied up George like that nicely. He's only picked him up and carried him into the kitchen. <laughs> now, they're sitting in the kitchen, and nicely, he's having a cup of tea with him, and George is sitting there saying, yes, well, my daughter's 13 now. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, these two are bleeding best mates. What's going on here? So, I've got to him. I've got, come on. Come, we're done here now, mate. Let's go. He's gone, what now? All right. And he's got up. And just as we've gone to go, 
George, you went, uh, uh, can I just ask a question? Um, have you taken my grandmother's ring? I went, do what? He said, and, and, and my father's watch. And now he starts to rattle off a few bits and pieces that have got sentimental value to him. So, I've gone in the bag, pulled out his bits and I've left them. I don't need these things. They've got sentimental value to him. Let him have them. I'm only there for his money, really. And nicely he's looking at me like, yeah, go on, and I like him. So, anyway, we've left the bits and we've walked out. Now he's done it again. He's got another request. He's sitting there tidy. Well, well, can you untie me, please? Now, nice, he's gone. Now, George, you know we can't do that. We need to get away. Now, we can't have you going to that phone, can we? Now, he, hold on a minute. He's gone in the kitchen and he's gone through the drawers and he's pulled out this pair of scissors. And he's just slung the scissors at his feet and he went, it should take you about an hour to cut yourself free. Yeah, be lucky. And we walked out the door. Now, the strange thing about this is that about... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. The strange thing was, about four weeks later, I've been pulled in on this ID parade for it. Now, I said to my Julie, I went, I'm sorry, babe, I might not be coming back on this one. You know, the little heart's going like that, the poor cow. So I've gone in the ID parade. Not one of them looks like me. I'm standing out like a sore thumb here as well. They're all sitting there, all different heights and all that. I'm the tallest one there. I mean, he knows what I look like. I only had a cotter's uniform on and he's behind the glass. Now, the weird thing is, he didn't pick me out. For love nor money, I can't work out why he left me alone. He didn't pick me out. And the second thing was, that got me thinking, why did they want him dead? I quite liked him by the end of it, if I'm being honest. I admired his strength, but it's got to be over money, hasn't it? Danny, um, Jojo and, uh, and the jock, they, they didn't tell the authorities no, they didn't, because if they'd have done, they'd have been putting a target on their back. If they'd have gone to another nick, someone would have known their grass and someone would have done it. And that's what you call it, grass. Grassing, everyone knows that's what it is. Everyone knows what a grass is, but... Yeah, we know in general. Can, can you tell me exactly, to you, what a grass is? first names that come to my mind are Eddie and Billy Blundell, but you won't know they are. Now, what a grass is, and it doesn't mean anyone here, none of you are included, anyone who's a straight goer, that is, right? none of you are included, because you've got no other form of justice at your disposal. If you have your car stolen, you get mugged in the street, I expect you to pick up the phone to the old Bill. You stay on your side of the fence, you don't pretend to be like us. Now, I've got a lot of respect for people who go to work, I've got a lot of friends that are straight goers. And I respect these, I couldn't do it, but I respect these people who go to work a minimum wage just to feed their families. Good luck to them. But they don't pretend to be like us. Now, if you're like us and you're guilty, you're a career criminal, that's what you've chosen to do, and if you're guilty of something, as soon as you get nicked, it ain't no good to go, oh, do you know what, I don't fancy going to prison, so I'm going to blame him and him and him instead. What a stinking liberty. When I go on a bit of work, I have to know the man standing next to me is proper. Because we all get caught at some point. You can't do what we do and expect not to go to prison. You're always going to do that in this country. Now, I can give you an example of two rules that we have, really. Now, rules get broken, bended, but the proper men follow these rules. You don't ever, ever grass anyone and you don't thieve off your own. They're the two things we don't do. Some people do. Now, I'll give you an example. If I'm going on a bit of work on the pavement and there's three of us. Now, if two of my mates get away and I get caught, I'm expected to go away and do the prison and keep my mouth shut. It's only horrible people that go, I don't like being the only one in this boat. Now, I want to put you in it and all. I'm happy if my mates get away over the moon. And I'm expected to sit behind the wall and what I expect from them is to look after my family. Like a pension, Christmases, birthdays, make sure they've got the money. Make sure they're looked after. Got to have honour amongst thieves. Otherwise, don't even bother being in our game. Danny, you mentioned uh, Billy and Eddie. Billy and Eddie Blundell. 
Now, a little while after Reggie and Ronnie got nicked, there was loads of little arseholes out there who fancied them. I don't know why they fancied themselves as Reggie and Ronnie, because they weren't no role models. But these two did. They was the kind of people. Now, I didn't come across them in a social reason. I didn't sit there and drink with them. But I knew what they were. They're the kind of people in the pub now, we all know people like this, that talk themselves up. Everything out of their mouth made you cringe. Now you sit there and think, what an idiot. If someone else wants to talk you up, that's acceptable. Let someone say something about you, something nice, subtle compliments, lovely. But you start doing it yourself and you sound like an utter mug. And that's the sort of thing they do. I'm this, I'm that. They're not my cup of tea. So I'll never really socialise with people like that. But how we come across each other was a row. Now, the papers, this is why you don't trust the media, they called it mini-cab warfares, because I had a cab office and so did they, but it had nothing to do with that. What it was, was our mate Lenny, this is Lenny Thompson, my mate, he's, uh, his wife ended up having an affair with her cousin Pepe. Now, it got messy. I could sit here and go on about an hour just for this situation, but I won't. How it turns out is Lenny's got us behind him, and Pepe's got his, his cousins, Eddie and Billy. Now, Tommy Enever's ended up getting involved. He's had a row with Eddie. Eddie's got a bit mouthy. He's turned up down his yard, Tommy Enever, and then Tommy Enever's let a couple of shots off down the yard. Their cousin Pepe's grasped. Nicely, nicely, he's now involved because he's trying to make Eddie and Billy retract them statements. It was an utter mess. But I didn't need to get involved. They was, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I will die with nicely and Tommy Enever. But they didn't need me. They was handling it. So, my personal album started over a bit of bleeding jewellery. Unbelievable. Now, I'm in a pub called the Burnell Arms in East Ham. And years ago, we used to get people selling parcels. What that means is it's just Nick Gear. It could be clothes or jewellery, like with me. So this fella's in there selling this parcel of jewellery for him, and he's selling it like, for them. I mean, Eddie and Billy Blundell, that's who he's selling it for. And I'm in the pub, and I see him, and I go, look, let's have a look at that. And in this parcel was this ring, and it was worth more than everything in there put together. So now I want it, don't I? But I didn't have the money on me. My money was tied up in something else. So I said, look, can I take that, and I'll pay you at the end of the week for it. And the fella, I've got a good name everywhere. The fella went, yeah, yeah, no problem, Dan. I'll come and see you at the end of the week for that. We didn't get to the end of the week. Two days have gone by, and I'm in my cab office now, and we lived above it, my cab office moaners. I'm sitting there, my wife Julie, my mum Mona, and all my drivers are there, and a door bursts open, and this big bodybuilding twat comes through the door, and he goes, where's Danny O'Halloran? And I went, I'm Danny, who's asking? He went, Billy and Eddie sent me. I went, oh, I'll see you in a minute. I said, come through the back here. I don't talk business in front of my family. He went, no, 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 no. I'm going to my car. You can come out to me. And he slammed the door. Now, there's nothing I can do. I've got my mum. I've got my missus. All my drivers. I can't go and get tooled up and go outside. So I've just had to swallow and walk out, haven't I? So I've walked out the door. I've gone out. And as soon as I've got there, I've gone in. What's all this about, mate? And he went, don't fucking play dumb. He went, you took a fucking liberty taking them things on tick. Eddie and Billy didn't say you could have them bits on tick. Now go upstairs and go and fucking get them before I come in and get them, you skinny cunt. Now, he's just threatened to come into my house. I live above this place and just take what he likes. So, he's sitting like that in his car with his arm hanging out and I've, I'm at the window now and I've gone, all right, all right, look, no problem. I'm pretending now, you know, I'm worried. I'm not. I'm seriously not because I know what I'm going to do. So I've gone, all right, no problem. I went, look, I'm just going to have a quick fag fry cut and get him. Can you give us a minute? And I went, oh, can I borrow your lighter in your console? And he's sitting there all face grimaced up like that and he's turned his head to look at the lighter and get it. And as he's done that, I've done exactly what Frankie done. And I've got hold of his head and clamped my teeth onto his ear, bit a chunk out, spat it back in the car. The fella screaming at the top of his head. Now, I told you, a fight's over. These are the worst weapon you've got. 
These will do, if you can get close enough, these will do more damage than any other thing you can pick up and do someone with, I promise you. And no one wants to know. You have a bit, chuck, bit out your ear or your nose or your cheek, you don't want to fight anymore. You're more worried about the damage you've done. And he's like that, holding his ear. So I've opened the door, I've dragged him out, stuck my knee on his chest, and I'm punching him and punching And I've heard, Danny! And I've turned around. It's my wife, my mum, all the bleeding neighbours. The only one who was bleeding, smiling, he was a Sikh neighbour, Mr. Marhill. He's standing there like that with a smile on his face. And I, he was the only one that could walk around at all. We had a big blade like that. If I walked around with a blade like that, I'd be nicked instantly. So... I've stopped what I'm doing. I've got up. Everyone's got a face like thunder. As I'm walking in, I've heard crash. He's got back in the car where he's such a, in such a state, he smashed into one of the neighbour's cars. I had to pay for that. So, I've gone back inside and now I'm in the doghouse. Now, you'd have thought I started this row. I finished it. I didn't start it. He was threatening to come in my home. My mum and my wife and kids there, it was liberty. So a couple of days have gone by now. No one's talking to me. And my mum comes in my living room upstairs where we used to live. And she was well spoken, my mum. She gave herself elocution lessons. She went, uh, Daddy, um, there's, there's two men at the door and one of them's dressed up like a boxer. <laughs> I said, one of them dressed up like a bleeding boxer. Hold on a minute. So I've got up like that. And I've gone to the window. And it's Billy and Eddie Blundell across the road. Standing near their car. Now, Eddie Blundell, the twat, has got his jogging bottoms on, boxing boots and hand wraps. And he's standing there like that. He's not here for fun, is he? So, I've gone downstairs into the kitchen. And I, I didn't have a gun at the time. So, I pulled out this big blade and stuck it down the back of my strides. So, I've gone walking out there. And straight away, Eddie Blundell's gone, Now, Dan, you took a fucking liberty with our mate the other day. Now, come on, let's sort it out like men. Let's have a straight up. Let's have a fair fight. I thought, yeah, I will, won't I? Right, I've gone, yeah, all right, then, coming in. And I've gone walking over him, his little brother Billy shaping up. I've pulled the blade out, and I've gone like that. And I've bleeding missed him. All right? <laughs> Completely missed him. He's gone back like that. His little brother Billy, now I'll give it to Billy Blundell. I don't like the man, he's an arsehole, but he had more guts than his brother. And he could have a ram on his brother. And he's tried to go in for me, so I've gone for him and missed him as well. Now, what they've done is they've run round the other side of the car and now I'm running after them. Now we're running round the bleeding car and I ain't one for, I've got knackered, haven't I? I'm running round the car like that. I've got to the bonnet like that and I'm over the bonnet and they scream, put the blade down, put the blade down. I'm all bleeding likely, am I? And I'll, as I'm looking, I've looked up at my houses, all the neighbours' windows. Again, like that, all the curtains are being pulled back. They're all looking. Now I realise, the other night they had silence of the lambs, now they've got the bloody Benny Hill show. <laughs> So, I've got the blade like that across the car, and I've gone, do yourself a favour, and fuck off. If I see you at my house again, I'll blow your heads off. Now, I've gone to walk back in. Eddie Blundell, as he's jumped in the car, I, I mean, I didn't find it funny at the time, but I do in hindsight. He's got in the car, and he went, right, that's it. The gloves are off now, then. I thought this twat's turned up like a box. He wants to tell me the gloves are off the twat. So, because it was late at night, I just slept on it, and then I rang Tommy Enever the next day and told him. Now, in typical fashion, all he wanted to do was rock me. What have I told you? What have I said about having it with anyone that knows him? They're all fucking wrong uns, Dan. What are you doing buying parcels off them slags? I went, shut up, Tom. I didn't buy nothing off of them. It was someone else. I ain't explaining myself to you. Now Tommy wants to tell me we've got to go and do it. And I said, no. I said, no, look, we ain't lost no face, Tom. We don't have to go on these twats. Let's leave him. You've let a shot off down their yard. You took a couple of shots at them, for Christ's sake. And I've chased them around their car with a big blade. And so I wasn't concerned, we can leave it at that. Now, I hate saying this, but Tommy was right. I should have listened to him. Because about four weeks later, me and Nicely have ended up going in this pub in Barking called The Volunteer. Now, we've walked in now, and I've gone, oh, man, it's 
Billy and Eddie Blundell and about six of their mates, they're firm-handed in now. Now, personally, I'd have liked to have gone and come back when it was more in my favour. But if we leave, they're going to follow us out to the car park and try and do us out there. If we stay, it's going to happen anyway. So I quite admire nicely. Nicely's a brave, brave man. And he's fronted it. He's not hiding from them. They're shouting things over. They're trying to talk to us. You know, you can't really hear them. So we've got closer. What do you say? And I've gone with nicely like that. Now, Billy and Eddie have got closer. We got closer. Nicely said a couple of things. I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said a couple of things to him. And Billy Blundell's picked up this bottle and he's gone crunch right over the top of his head. So I've gone for his brother. Now, as I've done that, I've got this bleeding arm. Go right behind me. And I felt this sharp thing up me, Rick. It's a big blade. One of their pals has got me like that. And just nicely he's wiped the glass out of his head. Just as he's gone to go big, I've gone, leave it, leave it. He spun round and saw the blade on me and stopped. Now I've gone to the fellow who's over me, get your arms off of me, you mug prick. Blundell's give him a nod like that, and he's let go of me. He pushed him off me like that. And I've got older nicely, who wants to carry on the round now, he's adrenaline, he's going, I'm going, come on, come on, let's go. And we've left the pub. Now, everyone in that pub saw what happened. They all saw. And it'll be Chinese whispers next. It won't be what really happened. It'll be 10 times worse. And that'll be they was kicking us around on the floor like rag dolls and wearing mugs and all sorts. And I can't have that. So now I know what we've got to do. Now I know we've got to go on them. And we've got to fucking well do them. So now, me and Nicely have gone straight back to Tommy's house and we've had to sort him out. Cutler, he's got a little cut in his head and Tommy's going mental. Tommy's wanted to do these for ages. I told you this would happen. Now, I hate it when someone says that, don't you? But we've got to go on them now. So, Tommy straight away says, right, I'm ringing up Shorey. Now, this was another one of our friends who used to come on the pavement with us and it was a fella called Roy Shaw. Now, he was a prize fighter, but he was game as you like when it came to earning a couple of quid and all. And he was close with me, Tommy, and especially Tommy's sister, Rosie. So I've left that to him. I said, right, you get hold of Roy and I'll get hold of Tyrone. Now, Tommy couldn't get hold of Roy. I can't remember if he was banged up or out on the piss for a couple of days, one of the two, but I've got hold of Tyrone. Now, we didn't have mobiles back then. It's not like you just get hold of someone like that, but I've managed to get hold of him. And the first thing he's done, he, I don't want to know the details, Dan. I'll come and meet you around Tommy's and we'll fucking do these arseholes. And I was just pleased he said that. So, now, you've got me, Tyrone, Nicely and Tommy to go on them and we're going to their cab office. They have one in yours. So, we've pulled up behind this car outside their office one of their drivers, Billy Blundell, is standing outside talking to him and he spotted us. Now the fat little shit has turned around and bolted straight into his office like a whippet. Now Tyrone and Tommy are out of the car's lively. Now they both had handguns. Me and Nicely in the booth had a couple of sawn offs because we was going to go on a bit of work in a couple of weeks so we took them with us. And we had a couple of baseball bats and all in there. So they're out like lightning. This is all happening in seconds. They're in there letting shots off like the OK Corral. Me and Nicely have gone behind the boot. And as I'm trying to get the key in the boot, Nicely's nudged me. I've turned around, and in their cab off, he's standing in an alleyway. And there was a wall there. And we've seen a couple of fat little legs come over the top and drop down and come running down the alley. It's Billy Blunder. He's come running down the alleyway, spotted us outside the boot, turned and run to his car. Now, you know that saying, Less speed, more haste. I'm like that, trying to get the key in the boot to get the tools out. And he's got to the, 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 his car door and pulled out a full-length shotgun. Nicely, he's dived behind the car. The car door was open, so all I could do was just go in, like that. And he's let off a couple of shots. Now, I don't know where they went. I think one of them did it, the car, somewhere. But all I've got on me in my bottle is a bottle of ammonia. And I know Nicely, he's got this lock knife. So all I can do is start the engine and just drive it in. So that's what I've done. I've put my foot down 
And as I've gone at him, he's gone bang. He's let a shot go. He's hit the car. I think he took the wind mirror out or something. And I've carried on going to go at him. He's dived out of the way. The car's gone through the cab office and he's let off another shot. Now this time, this time this shot has taken out my windscreen, taken out the dashboard. The speedometer has gone everywhere. And I felt that on the side of the face. I've caught the spray. The shotgun spreads like that. So where I've caught the spray and my adrenaline's going, I ain't really felt it. But there's blood everywhere, so I can't see. You know, he's doing that when it's above your eyes and all that. So I've opened up the door, got out of the car, stumbled out of the car. As I've got out, I've seen Blundell, with an empty gun, it's cocked, running back down the alleyway and nicely chasing after him, <laughs> like that. So I've run after him, I can't see nothing. I'm doing that, wiping all the shit out of my eyes and that. I've gone in the alleyway and nicely jumped on him like a lion on a gazelle. Now he's turned around, he's going, hold him, Dan, hold him. So I can't see nothing, I'm bleeding all like that and I've got hold of him. I've got his arms up his back. Nicely he's pulled out his blade and now he's begging. Now he wants to beg for his eye. Please, please don't do it, come look. You can hear the old Bill, they'll be here in a minute. We could, in the distance. And nicely he's gone to him. Uh, now, 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 don't worry about that, Bill. You'll be dead before they get here. And he's gone crash, crash, done him. Bad, three times. He did him that bad, he nearly did me. I'm holding him, well, hold on, hold on. Now, he did the right thing, Bill. When he got cut, all he did was put his hands on his face like that and scream through gritted teeth. That's the right thing to do. And he's dropped to his knee. Now, I told you I was spiteful. I'm not making excuses here. So what I've done was I pulled his hands away from his face and I got out my bottle of ammonia and I emptied the bottle right in his face and he screamed out, his cuts have gone like that, he's in bits now. Tommy and Tyrone heard him from inside the office. They're done now, they've come back down the alleyway and they've seen us drop blunder on the floor and we've had to go, have it on our toes. Now. I don't know what happened in the office. So I went, what, what, what happened? So only went, well, I shot one of the fucking mugs, didn't I? He's got one of them. But Tommy shot Eddie Blundell in the gut. And right there. And Blundell has crawled out the back of his office. And they had a shed in their backyard, out, out where their premises were. And he's locked himself in the shed. Apparently, someone was on all fours and helped Billy Blundell get over the wall. This is all happened while we was outside. So now he's in the, uh, in the shed. Tommy's gone in with his gun. He had this old Luger, old German gun. Very reliable gun normally. He's gone in the shed and Blundell is pissing himself, literally. And he's put the gun to his head and he's begging, please, please, Tom, please, mate, please, Tommy. And he's put the gun to his head like that and he's pulled the trigger. He's out of bleeding ammo. Now, Tommy, as he's walked out, has left him to bleed out, but he's done that line. He always reminded me of that one out of the life of Brian. He's walked out going, you lucky, lucky bastard. And just left him there to bleed out. Now, we have to have it on our toes. When you do someone, you've got to get away. We don't know if they're dead. They could have been dead. We're up for murder. So we have to find out what's happened. You do that away from the scene of the crime. Now, what we got told wasn't that they was dead. We didn't expect this. What they did is they'd fucking named us. The dirty, no good fucking grass cunts had fucking named us. Now I have to apologise to the ladies here for my language here. But I can't help it. These are supposed to be villains. Supposed to be proper men, they want to go to war with us, but when it don't work out in their favour, they want to say our names. Now, how I know this is I saw the statements. I saw them. They retracted their statements when they found out how everyone would know their grasses, but it's too late. The damage is done. As soon as they say our names, they don't need to be in court because the old bill knows who to nick. They know where to go, didn't they? It's Danny O'Halloran, it's Tommy Enever, it's Nicely. Now, it's funny, isn't it? Tyrone didn't get named or nicked. He's from South London. They didn't have a clue. They'd never met him before. Didn't have a clue who he was. So how can they pull him in? Now, 
This is a perfect example of a grass. The moment they mentioned our names, it's too late. The damage is done. This is what a grass is. It's Danny and Tommy. Now, even if they retracted the statements, which they did, only because they was worried what everyone was going to say, it's too late. The old bill nicked us. They've got us. So, when we're all nicked, I wanted everyone to know what they are and what they'd done. So I bought a greyhound. And I called it Blundell's Grass. And I raced it everywhere. Now you can imagine all the chaps over at Walthamstow, Blundell's Grass is in first place here, pissing themselves, laughing, they're clapping and everything. Now they're ruined. Now I love that little dog, it didn't stop winning. <laughs> it didn't stop winning, the dog, I loved it. But we ended up doing burp for these lot. For these dirty, no good grass legs, I've ended up doing two years. Tommy, and nicely, got a bit more, but their sentences got brought down, quashed a little bit, but we still ended up doing bird for these people. So now, we had to give them a choice. When we got out, we can go back on them and do them. If we do that, where are the old bill going to look? If we kill them, Who's going to be the first suspect? So we don't really want to do that. I don't want to spend life inside for a grass. None of us do. So we gave him the choice of pissing off. Go back to Essex, where you come from originally. Why don't you piss off? Leave your ice cream vans, leave your cab office, and piss off out of London, because if anyone in London bumps into you, they're going to get it. This is a good example as well. Funny enough, 30 years later, now we're done with these. The row's done, finished, as far as I'm concerned, they're not worth talking about anymore. But I'm banged up in Chelmsford now, on a drugs charge. Now, I don't like drugs, I hate them. But when we couldn't rob banks anymore, it becomes so hard, we have to do other things. I don't know anything else. It's too late for me. So I get bail. Now, while I was away, I had a cellmate. I don't usually have a cellmate, unless they're proper stuff. And I had one proper man away with me. Now, when you're in a cell with someone, you get very, very close. You're shitting a busy next to someone. You've got to be. And the fella that was away with me was a fella called Patsy. Now, he's a good man from around here. And now, he's phoned me. While I'm out on bail, and he went, Dan, you'll never guess who was in here last week. Now, I hate it when people say that. I could be there all bleeding days playing a bloody guessing game. I went, Pat, come on, mate, come on, Pat. So he just bleed and tell me what? Who? He went, Billy Blundell came in. I went, get out. He didn't, did he? He went, he did. So what's happened? On a visit, this is the way that it works. The family come in, the screws tick your name off. This is after you go through the metal detectors and all the other crap. Is they'll walk in and they'll give the list of the family to another screw who will have the cons in another room waiting to see their families. And they go in and they just say, visit for Jones, visit for Smith, and they'll come out. Now, Patsy's sitting there waiting to see his wife and his boy, and he is, visit for Blundell. He goes like that, doesn't he? He knows, he's my pal. And this little fat bald fella walks past him and he goes, yeah, you Blundell, your name Blundell. He goes, yeah, that's right. Patsy goes to him, all oh, right, you grass my mate Danny O'Halloran, you slag, and went to him, crash, punched him right on the chin. Now they've had a roll about. They're having a roll about, all the screws are breaking them up and all that. Now, they've been sent, they, they're not going to get the visit now, they've been sent back to their cells. <laughs> when Blundell found out Patsy's last name, he put himself on protection. <laughs> Arsehole. Now, what I'm trying to explain here is this just goes to show, doesn't it? I didn't raise a finger. I didn't have to do a thing to him. This is someone else. This is how a grass gets treated in London. Now, I've got mates in South London. North London, east, all over. Doesn't matter to me where you're from, you're proper or you're not. Now, these people treat grasses exactly the same. That I, and I didn't have to do this to Blundell, but that's what happens to them. I'm rightly bleeding so, and all. And that was 20 years old? 90s. This happened in 71. This is 30 years on. Just over. I've got 10 years, but this is in the 60s. But at the time, I was doing all right. Now, I told you I had a cab office. Now, a cab office for me, 
Now, I'm always going to do what I do. I don't know anything else. But I did like that little business. And I called it Mona's, after me mum. And we had quite a laugh at the cab office. We had, we had some really good customers. One of them was a fella called Don Meldrum. And he was the editor of Reuters News. And even when that thing happened with the Blundells, he phoned my Julie. Phoned her up, and he told her what happened, like, in code, on the phone. But he didn't print anything. What a good man. He let all the other papers do it, and he held back. And then we had Dave Sullivan now. I think Dave Sullivan, he's, he's got a football club now, I think. But he used to be in the pawn game. And he had loads of pawn shops. And we did deliveries and weddings with our cab office. Weddings were good. No, we used to earn money out of that. And it meant I could drive flash cars and no one used to bat an eyelid. Good cover. But Dave Sullivan's uh, pawn shops, we had one in Upton Lane called Private Eye. And me and Julie used to go and do the deliveries. Now, I hated Julie doing them deliveries. I liked Dave, but I hated them because she'd take a big box with dildos hanging out and all these bleeding leather masks. I don't know what art of this shit was for. <laughs> but I didn't like that, you know, a lovely little bird walk tottering down the road with his big dildo hanging out. I thought, I'll, I'll go and do that delivery if I can. <laughs> but I quite liked Dave. He was a good businessman. And the reason I liked him is because I felt sorry for him because running a business in the sex game, the old Bill kept kicking his doors off. Like they kicked mine off. The difference between me and him is he was innocent and I was guilty. But we did well out of it. And we had some laughs, like there was this one cab driver we had called Eddie. And he used to pick this call girl up. Now, I don't think he earned any money out of her. I think it was the other way around. But he was, I'll go and pick her up. I'll go and get her. And it's one day, we're all sitting in the cab office. Even my mum was there. And all of a sudden, we had them CBs, you know, over and out ones. We can hear it. It's just come over the radio. They're rumping like you wouldn't believe. He's only lent on the bleeding receiver in the car to twat, hasn't he? <laughs> we can hear everything. So we're sitting there laughing our heads off, and he comes walking back in after the job. Have a nice time, did you? What are you talking about? Ain't it like that, the idiot? But we like that little cab office, but it was never going to be my main source of income. So I was going to go back to what I did. And in them days, we had a lot of lorry drivers that wanted to lose their load. And I've done it before with people. You do it with people you trust. But this time, we had an absolute straight goer, me and me pal Albert. Now, this fella's come up to us and he's told us about his load he's got. And it was Italian handmade shoes. Now, the only thing I can tell you that, that you might relate to now is it's like having a lorry load of Pradas or Gucci. How much do you think a 40-foot lorry would come out of that? Pound signs in my eyes, aren't I? Oh, I'll have a bit of that. But this is greed on my part, because he was an utter straight goer, I wouldn't have normally have took that risk, but we did. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So, we took the risk, me and Albert, and it was simple enough. He used to pull up on the A1. So, the idea is, we pull up behind him, we give him a clump. Now, this was hard work. He knew he's going to get a clump. Every time I'm going like, eh, eh, he's flinching all the time. Albert had to whip him without him looking. Eh, you're not going to do it. I know. I went, crash. Now, this is what an idiot the fella was. We've got to tie him up and all, haven't we? And leave him roadside. And he went, can I have a lift home? Are we really going to take you home, you tot? So, we've drove the lorry back to the slaughter now. And that was simple, it should have gone like that. And it worked like a dream until he went in work. And the old Bill were there with his work to question him and he folds. He don't write outright grass. They didn't outright grass us. But he gave them enough information and folded and tripped over himself where they knew where to look. Now, because he's not credible, they went and found another witness. This old bird. She must have been wearing night goggles. Across the bleeding road. This was, this was night time, this happened. And so, we've ended up getting 10 years. And the reason we got 10 is before that, the great train robbery had happened. So they was banging us up, big chunks of bird. I was only expecting a five for what I did. And they give us a charge of kidnapping. How the bleeding hell can we kidnap someone who's in on the job? This goes to show you should never trust the bleeding media or the papers. They called us when we got nicked. End of the road for the A1 highwayman. Load of crap. So now... I'm looking at a chunk. This is, there's no such thing as parole. 10 years meant 10 years. When that judge slams that hammer and he says 10 years, that's what it means. Now, the light at the end of my tunnel, it's like a fly's arse, like that, non-existent. 
Because now, wherever I go, that's going to be my home. I have to live there for that amount of time. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it the way I want to. I'm going to live the way. So I didn't behave. I was a lot younger then, but I'm not going to behave like a good little prisoner. I'll do whatever I like in my own, wherever it is. And I ended up having a few fallouts with a few screws. And ended up getting a name for myself for doing screws. So I got shipped out of London and ended up putting me in Lincoln. And that was a shithole. Now I'm in there. And now I'm having egg with the screws. And one of them broke my nose. First time I'd ever had my nose broke. Never on the street, never in a row, but in there in the nick by one of them. Now I've got a bad name. You've got strikes against your name for doing screws. So I've gone from there. And then they've moved me to the worst one. I ended up going to Dartmoor. Now, Dartmoor is over 300 years old. It was built to house Napoleon's soldiers. Now, just imagine how shitty and old this place is. Now, there was a couple of people in there I knew. It's well away from London. But we had someone like Gordon Goody in there. He was on the Great Train Robbery, and I like Gordon. His wife used to come up with Mar Julie on visits. They'd come together. So, I'm sitting in... Dark morning, reading me the right act. The Ed Walden. If you think you're a gangster in here, you've got another thing coming. This is Dartmoor. You'll do what I say when I say. I thought, yeah, I bleed well, will, and I. So, they've put me in this cell. And normally, you'd think all the cells were the same. They are, to a certain extent. But, they all look the same, but some of them are colder. Might have a really cold cell, might have a crack in the glass, letting all the cold air in. Or there might be another one, which did my chest in severely. You'd have all condensation running down the walls. Now, I'm in my cell now, they want to move me. I, they do screws hate me because I've been doing screws for about a year or two now. And now it's on me. Now they want to be nasty. And right, come on, O'Hara, we're going to move you. The cell they wanted to move me in had had someone in there who'd done something called a dirty protest. Now, this is filth. But I'll tell you what a dirty protest is it's when they smear their shit all over the walls. Now they can clean this up but it'll still stink and I know that's where they want to put me. So this big screw comes in and I'll call him Breslau. That's what I called it. Bernard Breslau from the Carry On films. He was about six foot five and a big dope like the character and all. And he's coming on my story. Come on O'Hara and you're moving. Oh no am I? He said yeah we're moving and I knew where they was putting me. I said no I ain't going nowhere. Now to cut a long story short I'm not going to go into the violence and everything else but we've had a struggle because I won't go. And they've had a couple of screws to come in and bash me up. But what Breslau did was he took a massive liberty. While they've got me down, just because I gave him the elbow in the struggle, they've pinned me down and he's toe punted me, flush in the nose, right on the snuts, and split the bridge of my nose. I had two black eyes. I was whistling when I was sleeping for a week. Now, I'm not going to let him get away with it. I'm not having it. I don't care who he is, if it's a con or screw, they're going to take a liberty, I'm going to do them. I was very violent this time, I'm not proud of it, I was a lot younger then, but I weren't going to let them break me. And that's what they was trying to do. So, in the nick, they put you to work. Now, on this occasion, we was making socks. And there was this balcony that we was on. Right eye up, and there's a procession of prisoners, with all sewing machines, has a weight on it and we make these socks on them and there's a screw that walks up and down watching you. Now underneath the balcony there's another procession on the ground floor. Procession it's exactly the same as us, one on the bottom, one on the top. And this day I'm looking over the balcony as I'm working and I'm seeing Breslau walking the line up and down watching the screws. So I've waited till my screws turned his back and I've undone the weight. I've hung over like that, waited for Breslau to get a nip and what? Split his head wide open. He was in hospital for a week, so they beat the shit out of me and took me down solitary confinement block. Now, solitary ain't what everyone here thinks. There might be some people that know, but I bet most of you don't. You watch these films and that, and you think you're in this dark hole with cockroaches running about you. No, it's worse. I wish it was dark, I might have got to sleep. You have this light on, this horrible false light, 24 hours a day. The cockroaches won't even come out because it's so bloody bright. You have no socialisation, you have no books, you have no visits. Even my Julie come up to see me and got turned away. They didn't even tell her. 
I was in solitary. I know, that's not fair on her, is it? Could at least told her, coming from London to Dartmoor. So, I'm in now. I've got nothing around me now. Monday turns into Tuesday. Night turns into day. You have no idea what day of the week it is. And I'll promise you, when you're in them conditions, you get to know yourself very, very well. And I did. Be times where you talk to yourself because you ain't heard your own voice in a week. Forgot what my own voice sounded like sometimes. So, after about three weeks of being down the block, the warden comes in with an army of screws because you've got a bad name. I expect trouble. And he opens the door. He says, have you had enough now, O'Halloran? And I went, <clears throat> right in his face. Now, he's just done that. Give him another week and they bash the shit out of me again. Now, when I got out, they're going to move me now. But luckily, luckily, they've moved me back to London. I'm in Parkhurst now. This is where I ended up with Frankie Fraser. Now, when I got to Parkhurst, I had some good news. Parole had just come out. Just come into force. Now, I know someone like Gordon Goody ain't going to get it. He's too high profile. The public are going to scream, no, 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 and the establishment never going to let, but I've got a good chance. So what I did, I was already married with my Julie. We got married in a registry office. But I married her again for a second time. A church wedding this time. And they had to let me out because it looks good for parole. You know, family man having a church wedding and all that. And it did, did actually do me well. And so uh, I ended up getting parole and coming out. But that was the longest one I did in one year. You've mentioned uh, family now. I know you've got uh, four children. The youngest is called Ryan. Could you tell me about him? Why, what's he said or done? <laughs> I don't think he's said or done anything wrong, as far as I know. But I'd just like to hear what you think. Now, I love all of my kids. I ain't got to profess my undying love to anyone here. They know, that's good enough. And out of my four kids, I've got two that won't be told. Two that just do their own thing. But Ryan, he won't even bleed and listen. He's got a mouth like Black Wall Tunnel, talks before his brain's engaged, a little shit. Now, I do love him. He's a funny little sod. He goes in the pub and he makes people laugh and things like that. And that's all great. But he ain't going to get a job like that, is he? No one's going to hire you to do that. And so, I got him his first job. Now, as a parent, you always worry about your kids. I never wanted my kids to do anything I did, and I won't have it. And luckily, they don't. It's never affected them like that, thank God. But you worry in other ways as well. What's he going to do with his life? He's going from one job to another. Now, I've got him a job with a friend of mine. He's lost that. <laughs> then he went and got another job, lost that as well. Now, a trend's happening here, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do with this boy? Now, he gets to about 22, and he comes up to me like that. Dad, here, listen, um, I think I know what I want to do with myself here. Dad, can you help me? I went, oh, my God. He got me this. He's got direct. He knows what he wants to do. I went, what do you want to do, boy? He went, well, I want, to, I want you to pay for me to go to acting school. I went, fucking acting. Fucking acting. Are you bleeding well serious, boy? Need him well acting. He'd last five minutes, get chucked out, another two minute one, I'd spend thousands of pounds on him. And even if he did do it, even if he did do it, what's a young boy at Meese London going to get? Be bleeding these tenders. He said, I can't even watch that shit when Julie's watching it. I walk out of the room. You've seen that dialogue. Not one of them are from East London, I promise you that. And he wouldn't even get hired for that, the little shit. And I said to him, I said, look, stop talking like I did, low boy. You are going to get a proper job. End of. Bleeding acting. Well, does he live in? Well, does he live in? Before I invite, um, uh, before I invite I you questions, uh, people directly, I ask my last Directly, I, uh, my last question to you is about Prairie Flower. Now, Prairie Flower is my Julie. Now, I met her when she was 16. And she was a raving salt back then. She'd walk in a pub and every head would turn it because, oh, look at her. Now, she didn't want to know me. She didn't want to know me when I met her. Now, my pal Cyril was seeing her sister Gloria. Now, I've gone round the house, and I've bumped it, I've seen her, I thought, God, what a salt. And I've gone to Cyril, I've gone, come on, sort it out for me, get us out on a double date. Cyril's gone to have a word with her, and she said, what, that big, long, tall, skinny fella? Yeah. You don't want to know that. Anyway, 
Jez come out with me, and we went out on this date, our first one. And I've got lagging drunk in this pub, and I don't dance. I've got her up dancing. I look like bleeding beanstalk when I dance, but I've got her up, and they dance. But you're not allowed to dance in this pub. We've got slung out. Now, it was still a good date. We've had a right laugh, and I found out how funny she was. Now, not just superficially how beautiful she was. She was a lovely person inside. Lovely person, and a funny little sod. She could mimic everyone. If someone had a little funny way of talking, she'd be doing it and all that. She's not horrible, she's not two-faced, but she's just funny. Really funny. And she didn't ask too many questions, which was good. I told her I was a shirt salesman. <laughs> but I don't really want to sit here and uh, gush about my family. That's not my way. I, now, I couldn't care what anyone here thinks, but I do care what my family thinks. Now, they know what I think of them, and that's important to me. And I don't want to sit here and gush about my wife. But I can tell you what she's done, the things that she's done. Now, people have said to me through the years, you and I have done some bird, Dan. Oh, you're not a strong-minded man. She's done every day. Every day behind the wall I've done, she's done, and she's had it harder, in a way. While I'm in there, I'm fed, I'm clothed. I've got nothing to keep but myself. She's got bills. She had four kids to raise, fighting and arguing, a business as well. At the same time that she's running, she's the controller, she's the driver, she's a mother, and she's done more miles on prison visits than Scott of the Antarctic. Now, that's a lot. Now, even back then, they'd say, oh, well, I'm surprised she did, you know, that she stayed with you. Now, in them days, the women did stay with the husbands through thick and thin, but even back then, most women would have left me. She didn't. Strong, strong woman. Very strong woman. So, I'm also a fan of um, westerns. Love a western. John Wayne, True Grit, Butch Cassidy, The Sundance Kid, uh, even Clint Eastwood, Good, Bad, The Ugly. I love all these films. And so when I called her Prairie Flower, she did like it. <laughs> but she asked why. And so I told her. I said, now out on the prairie, it can be a cold and desolate desert. And there's only one beautiful thing that grows and survives for miles and miles around. And that's the prairie flower. Now, I'm not into silly pet names and all that like some people are. I called her that because it suited her. <laughs> now, she'll say, you only say that when you've done something wrong or I want something. But the truth is, my entire life and everything I've done is because I want her. And that's still the case to this day.